Good evening and welcome very, very much to Conversations. We're pleased to welcome to the program Sean Gervasi, and he is a uh, professor and a, a academic who's concerned with economics and particularly relevant to what we want to talk about tonight, has just returned from uh, a long stay in, in Belgrade, Yugoslavia, and knows something of that situation. And Sean Gervasi, welcome very, very oh, much to Conversations. Thank you very much, And back to New York. I uh, wonder if you might, maybe before we go into some detail about what in the world is going on in terms of the Balkans, from your you know, experience there and so forth. Maybe you could share a little bit of your own background. You did some economics. You're interested in economics. Well, and I'm basically an economist. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I studied in Europe, uh, came back to graduate school at Cornell, Yeah. went into the federal government, resigned. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, right, right. And were involved with uh, the, the, the area in the Balkans, you had some reason to be con uh, concerned with that area, particularly in, in some of your early life experiences? So well, I'd lived a long time in the Mediterranean. Uh -huh. uh, my father had been a diplomat posted in the Mediterranean and covered a number of countries there for quite a long time after the war. Uh -huh. So I was living in the Med, and I've, I, I know a fair amount about Yugoslavia. I'm uh, particularly interested in American foreign policy, the economic aspects of that. And um, so when uh, things started getting really out of hand in the, about a year ago or more, mm -hmm. uh, some old friends of mine uh, whom I had known in the UN very well and who are uh, Yugoslavian uh, diplomats uh, spoke to me and uh, enticed me to come over to the Institute for a week or ten days. And uh, out of that I, I became... Uh, research prof in uh, Belgrade. Yeah, you research prof at the I Institute for the Study, I guess, of Economic and Political it's, Problems. Uh, the is, right, it's the yeah. Institute for International Politics. All right, right, yeah. So it's concerned primarily with, uh, with uh, understanding the international aspects of, uh, of Yugoslav's uh, position, position. And uh, uh, I, it's really been the premier research institute in Yugoslavia since 1948 or so when mm -hmm. it was founded. It was very large uh, with a very substantial staff which has now been cut in about half. It's still about 60, 70 people. Uh -huh. But uh, it's uh, the equivalent of, uh, of a major think tank in the United States, obviously without the connections and power that those have. Yeah. Although many members of the government, the federal government primarily, have gone in and out of the institute and government back and forth. Uh, and, th and that's a long-standing institution. I mean, well, it was founded in 1948, if I remember correctly. Yeah, right after the war with Tito and right. so forth. And a unique position. Of, it's interesting that they tack on the end economic problems. <laughs> problems they have in the Balkans, right. and that is for certain. Um, and what a vantage point has been for you over these last? Uh, now we're, we're we're taping now on February twenty four, right? Oh, nineteen ninety three, and you've been there. Well, I went Belgrade. to I went to the institute in August. I was appointed in August. So you've been close. And to And I've the been scene. in and out pretty much. Uh, I've been back to the states three times, but I've spent a good bit of time there over the last uh, uh, six seven months. Yeah, and as you said, things began to come apart, as you put it, mm. about. A year ago now, as you well, say it, or um, maybe maybe you yeah. could. Just let's, why don't we, from a, in a primer sort of way, start slow. Maybe you could <laughs> set the set the stage for us here, because the Balkans, since uh, since uh, in, in modern history, it's been a it's been a pivot point for world developments. After all, the first war started there. There's been a Indeed. clash of cultures and so forth. Maybe you could give us a little of that historical development of the crucial nature and geopolitical crucial nature of that that particular region fill right. in the general audience. Well, actually, that uh, it's the crucial geopolitical nature of the region which really explains the founding of Yugoslavia uh, in the beginning, in 1918, as, uh, as uh, a state uh, uniting the South Slav nations, uh, the, the, the Republic of the Serbs, Slo uh, Croats, and Slovenes, uh, Kingdom of the Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes. Um, Yugoslavia is a, in a very unique position in some respects because uh, it's been struggled, uh, it's been the focus of struggle between, for a long time, the Habsburg Empire mm. on the one hand, the Ottoman Empire on the other, yeah. and uh, a focus, therefore, of European interest because it really represented uh, the demarcation line between the Eastern Empire and uh, the West in some sense. And, um, 
that demarcation line uh, moved uh, up and down the Balkan Peninsula yeah. wildly according to the various struggles which were going on between the 14th, 13th century and the 19th century. Mm -hmm. And it was really uh, with the collapse of the Ottoman Empire and of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Habsburg Empire in uh, 1918 yeah. as a result of the First World War that a vacuum was created in a sense in that area and the western countries the the the, the entente really wanted to to see a solid uh, political entity there in order to guard against uh, don't forget this is shortly after the soviet revolution that's right in order to guard against a very traditional uh, russian soviet expansionism into the mediterranean yeah, even, even this is even following the, the First War. Following the First World War, I think that yeah. Yugoslavia was envisioned by the Allies at that time as a kind of bulwark against the expansion of the, of the, um, of the, the Russian Revolution, the Soviet Revolution into the Balkans. And the Yugo of Yugoslavia, does that mean unity, or does it have a literal translation? It means the union, of the, the, the union of the Slavs. Really. Of the Slavs, as that was what literally the word means. And it brought together... Prior to that, those, those ethnic identities, which in various ways are being asserted so obviously now, ha go way back, uh, the, the distinction of the, of the, the Serbs. The well, Croats, of course, the, the... Bosnians, and then you get into Kosovo. Well, right? Bosnians, that's a, that's a rather yeah. artificial conception. All right. it's, it's, an, it's not an ethnic conception all right. at all. The ethnic groups in the area are historically the three South Slavic uh, ethnicities, if you like, mm. Serbs, Croats, Slovenes, uh, the first and the third being traditionally under the influence of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and Catholic. Mm -hmm. The latter being uh, much closer to Russia and uh, Orthodox. But there are a very large number of significant minorities mixed in there. Um, significant numbers of them too, Hungarians, Albanians, Macedonians, Montenegrins, and then there are even other peoples there. Now so, the, the, yeah. the, the Montenegrins and so forth, are they, these would be subcategories of these three main groups? If you no, well the no Montenegrins far. really are very closely related to the Serbs, but the Albanians are not at all, no, neither are the Hungarians, and, and the Macedonians are more complicated. They are Slavs, but they've also, being in the southern part of that area, they've also lived for centuries under a strong Turkish influence. Yes, indeed, yeah. And there are uh, Muslim, there's a significant Muslim population uh, in uh, Macedonia, as there is, of course, in Serbia in the province of Kosovo, where the Muslims are Albanian. Yeah, and then, and, and then you have Skopje is to the south, the city of Skopje is to the south. Is that into the capital of Macedonia. That's into Macedonia right. there, and that's not been in the news up till now, and let's hope that it does not become. But let's hope it's in any in, in any event, the uh, so there's this clash of the uh, of of these of these power of these uh, entities there after the first war, and then um, following upon the the and and then there's also been a, a considerable um, German interest or the German interest. Well, in there's been a historic German interest in the area. The Germans have uh, always. Uh, Particularly the South Germans, the Bavarians, have always looked uh, with some uh, possibly cupidity mm. on <laughs> Croatia and on Slovenia. The Austrians have very close relations with Slovenia, and of course uh, Germany for a time absorbed Austria. They're very close culturally, ethnically, etc. Um, and Germany, of course, has always uh, been interested in particularly the dominance of the domination of Central Europe. I mean, this yeah, is an issue yeah. that goes way, way back to yeah. the Bismarckian Empire. Yeah. And possibly one might also say that Germany has been interested in having access uh, to the Mediterranean through gaining entry into the Adriatic That's uh, interesting, via yeah. Croatia. Yeah. That's not insignificant. Yeah, right. Yeah. And the Baghdad, they had a railway that went out to... The Berlin to Baghdad yeah, railway? Right, right, right. I forget actually where exactly that passed, yeah. but it must have passed through the vicinity. But that is interesting. We want to talk some about the, 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 the Mr. Cole's role in the, in the more modern experience with Indeed. Croatia. But maybe we could uh, 
pursue this historical development a little bit here. Right. Um, there was then, of course, the growth of, uh, of uh, Nazi Germany, and there was the expansion. And they they uh, moved into the into the, uh, into the, the First World War. Obviously, did start at Sarajevo right. with the uh, assassination of the Archduke. But bringing it up into the mo more modern experience was that uh, the Balkans was an area where the Nazi forces actually experienced considerable difficulty with guerrillas that held out and fought right. them, and they never were really to assert themselves as powerful as they were. The Wehrmacht on the on the ground against some of those guerrilla forces, or am the, I off base? Huh? No, 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 that's absolutely right. This they fought like the, tigers the, against the German the, forces. Um, the Second World War was a very important experience uh, in the Balkans, especially in Yugoslavia. Uh, the Germans created a puppet state in Croatia, which was called the Independent Croatian State. Mm -hmm. Uh, this was very large, included all of Dalmatia, a lot of, uh, almost all of what is presently Croatia, and Bosnia as well. So it was a very large area. That was the area which they occupied. The Italians were given a piece of Montenegro and had some activities in other parts. When would they have done that? What year would that 1941. have been? 1941. When the Germans invaded in 1941. Okay, right. They created this independent Croatian state. And, and this is extremely important in understanding the present because the independent Croatian state included large numbers of Serbs, firstly. And uh, as Croatia and Bosnia today do, they include, there are about... Uh, probably in excess of two million Serbs living in Bosnia, what is now Bosnia and what is now Croatia. Uh, they were also in those areas at that time. In fact, there were probably uh, proportionally more of them. But the important thing to remember about the independent Croatian state, which is remembered very uh, sharply and bitterly today, mm. is that it was, a, it was a clerical fascist state. And uh, as a clerical fascist state, it pursued uh, quite uh, savage policies towards the minorities, towards uh, Jews, uh, Gypsies, and Serbs. And Serbs. And in fact, uh, I think there's a lot of historical evidence, and certainly it's taken for granted now in the Balkans, that uh, under the Nazis, the Germans, in fact, gave the responsibility to Pavelic, the head of the independent Croatian state, for carrying out a part of the Holocaust, which included the, the elimination of a large part of the Serb population. It was a very deliberate, racist, genocidal policy. Directed at the Serbs. Directed at the Serbs, the Jews, and the Gypsies. Yeah. And, it w and it's been recognized after the war by the United Nations as a policy of genocide. Now, in that uh, situation, in the, at that time, in a number of camps, primarily a camp called uh, Jasenovac, uh, in uh, Croatia, uh, uh, a very large numbers of Serbs perished, and very large numbers of Serbs perished when the Ustashi, the yeah. uprising uh, fascist uh, cadre, uh, military cadre, uh, attacked Serb villages, and uh, pretty horrible atrocities were carried out. Now, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of uh, controversy, obviously, over precisely how many people were killed, but. Uh, the range of estimates I can give you, which is generally accepted, except of course by the present Croatian president, yeah. uh, is between 300,000 and a million Good Lord. Serbs were exterminated at that time. And this was done in the name of a ra it was it, it was there was there a racist component yes, to that that they absolutely. were directing? I mean, as there what been against the Jews? Absolutely, it was exactly what was directed against the Jews. And yet the the Croats, Croats were Slavs. The Croats so also. the direction against the Serbians in something other than geopolitical demonizing right. it was a racist uh, absolutely or racist. ethnic uh, argumentation, well, and yet the Croats themselves were Slavs. It so was absolutely how racist. How were the Germanic well, the Aryan, uh, you know, ap appeal able to be able to find fertile ground among it, the Croatians? It was, it was the it was the clerical element which uh -huh. generated the difference between the two. The difference between people who had lived under the Catholic Church for a very long time mm -hmm. and people who remained in the Serbian Orthodox Church. I mean, and the, the under the underpinning of, of I don't know, was Bosnian or Muslim was there all along. These people well, were living. There, what was the attitude of the Croats toward those mm -hmm. Muslims who were there holdover? From, That's uh, an important point. The, the, the Ottoman influence. It's important to understand that these Muslims are ethnically Slavs. 
the Muslims in Bosnia and in other parts of Yugoslavia uh, are people who are the descendants of those Slavs forcibly converted when the areas in which they lived were under Ottoman occupation. Under the Ottomans, uh, the Slavs were, of course, seen as um, very lesser much folk. as lesser folk, yeah. precisely the phrase <laughs> I was thinking <laughs> of. Yeah. And uh, they were persecuted, discriminated against, uh, in fact, very often uh, in danger of their lives. They were very heavily taxed. Uh, and there was a lot of resistance to the Ottoman occupation. Now, uh, so ferocious was, uh, and it's very famous in literature, the, Ocuman, the Ottoman occupation that um, large numbers of Slavs did in fact convert to Islam, but as it were in a more formal, in a, in a formalistic sense. So that today, for instance, in Bosnia and in other parts of Yugoslavia, you have Muslims who are ethnically Slavs, blonde-haired, blue-eyed, yeah. very tall, etc., yeah. but who uh, are in a cultural sense uh, still formally Muslims who, are, by the way, many of them are not at all very religious. They're very modern for Muslims. Uh, but uh, they uh, are, regard themselves as, 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 as Muslims in some sense. And of course, as Yugoslavia began to break up, and even before that, there was a great deal of pressure uh, put on Muslims in places like that to become more Islamic. Now, one important point, I think, to remember about the experience of the independent state, the independent Croatian state uh, during the Second World War, was that as it included a, a significant uh, number of uh, Bosnian Muslims at that time, Muslims of Slavic origin, but descendants of converted Slavs, um, th again, those people were enlisted in, the, frankly, the genocidal war which was waged against other parts, other populations there. And in fact, the Muslims formed uh, the primary elements of two SS divisions mm -hmm. in Bosnia, and that is one of the bitter memories which uh, Bosnian Serbs have of that epoch, that the, that the Muslim population actively participated with the, uh, the, the Croatian uh, Ustashi mm -hmm. in the in the, in, the, in the genocidal attacks uh, which took place against uh, gypsies, uh, Jews, and Serbs. At Who that at that time, in that time frame, was in a certain sense, if that's the right term, backing, as it were, well, the, the Serbs. Nazis. Oh, the Serbs. the Serbs. Well, as you know, they were, they were uh, the country was totally occupied uh, by, Serbia was totally occupied by the Nazis. Mm -hmm. uh, there were, at that time, essentially two quite different groups of Serbs uh, r resisting that situation. Tito being one. There were, first of all, Tito's partisans who were, of all the Slavic nationalities, and, and including some Muslims, I believe, uh, Serbs, Croats, and Slovenes, the partisans were primarily, com were a multi-ethnic group, and obviously ideologically uh, uh, y unique and uh, not at all ideologically diverse, ideologically coherent mm -hmm. uh, around the idea of a future communist, uh, uh, a struggle for communism in the future Yugoslavia. It would tie to the Soviet Union. Oh, they were, they were, they, they, they were had political relationships with the Soviet Union, but the primary military backers, I would say, at that time, perhaps not the primary military backers of the partisans were the Allies. Yeah, right. right. And uh, but I, I was thinking in terms of the ideological. Thing oh, not ideologically, no, obviously. Right. And obviously but we Russian. were supporting them as we did. Uh, we, we supported, supported the Soviet We supported Union Tito. And, yeah. But there was another Serbian group yes, at the time that yeah. needs to be remembered because yeah. today it's a bit on the rise. And that is the, the, royalist, uh, the royalist Serbians calling themselves Chetniks. Uh -huh. uh, which meant refers that word refers to the old resistance fighters against the Turks. Uh, the Chetniks and the Partisans both fought the Nazis, but they also fought each other. So mm. the Second World War is a pretty hellish scene in Yugoslavia yeah, in the awful. sense that yeah. there's a triangular warfare going on. Mm. 
and the and the and the resistance that they that they that uh, uh, the, the Nazis and the uh, Croat compatriots and so forth uh, experienced was persistent and consistent Ooh. and uh, well remembered in the minds of many of the Western Europeans who had experience in that second mm -hmm. war that it was a, that there was a real major force that was launched against these invasion forces. Right. The, the partisans, particularly the partisans in Bosnia, uh, really pinned down a large number of German divisions and fought them to a standstill. Yeah. There's no doubt about that. Uh -huh. uh, that was <laughs> probably the most significant military opposition against the Nazi occupation. I think that might be well remembered by military advisors even as we sit and talk now. Oh, absolutely. There, yeah. are, many, there, are, many, there are many British intelligence officers. One we of them died well. recently. Uh -huh. Uh, a man named Lees, who wrote about uh, British relations with Tito, very, he, he was very much against them. Uh, he and a number of people like Fitzroy McLean, Basil Davidson, mm -hmm. uh, who was an MI6 officer in uh, Yugoslavia during the war, is now a very famous yeah. writer. Uh -huh. um, all of these people are uh, fully familiar with the intensity of that conflict and of its triangular character. And then there's building up among the people who inhabit that area these. Uh, historical and even contemporary, relatively contemporary experiences of deep animosity and hatred among the people who make it up, uh, uh, which might help account for the incredible chaos that seems to be emerging now. Well, I would, emphasize the, I would emphasize the very precise word you use, help account, yeah. because that's only part of it. In fact, I would say that one of the remarkable things about the period from 45 until quite recently, well, until 90, until 89 perhaps, yeah. is that uh, these uh, ancient antagonisms were very much uh, attenuated, I would say. Some people like to say repressed, other mm -hmm. people like, there's no doubt that uh, Tito was an enormously successful leader in this sense, that under the slogan of uh, brotherhood and unity, he succeeded really in composing, I would not say eliminating, mm. but he succeeded in composing the accumulated historical antagonisms between the various groups in Yugoslavia, and he built, uh, and the leadership of the Yugoslav uh, Communist League built what is surely one of the most successful federated states uh, in the history of the 20th century, far more successful in some respects than the Soviet Union was. Uh, it was, I would have said it was a model of federalism in many respects. And a model of federalism. Almost of, of, fe of federalism, not confederalism. I mean, it. it, it because the, 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 the. Of federalism. All right. The, Sorry, I didn't mean that. I'm not correcting you. Mm -hmm. I want to make the distinction because in, from the time of Tito's death, actually before, from the time of the 1974 Constitution, when there were clearly tendencies, possibly fostered already from outside, towards a much looser federation from the time of that constitution, when by, the, when, by the way, all of the republics of Yugoslavia were already declared sovereign, right? Yes, under, under so it's that, that's the sense in which you can already say that there's a tendency to, one sense in which you can already say that there's a tendency to confederalism mm -hmm. in Yugoslavia from the adoption of the 1974 constitution. The 74 constitution. The 74 constitution. It was already loosening up. There's just no doubt okay, about that. Okay, now, because at following the Second War and Tito emerged and uh, commu I mean, um, you had this uh, Mr. Churchill with his Iron Curtain and you had this, but Yugoslavia, which was a nominally socialist, communist, uh, alliant country, but was unique. There well, was a Yugoslavia. uniqueness to the rule that Mr. Tito was able right. to have. And he had a window, in a certain sense, on the West. Uh, more more so than a window, I like to say. I think I think something needs to be said about that. But it was, it, but he was also had a, a link to the communist. Uh, communist well, ideologically, yeah. Tito, of course, had very close links historically with uh, the Soviet Communist Party and yeah. the Soviet Union. Uh, and uh, in 1945, the uh, Yugoslavs established a communist state. But uh, I think Stalin did not regard Tito as a very good communist. Well, I would think he was he, a reason not to. I mean, he, he had an independent sure, streak. Yeah. Tito was a very strong person yeah. and very independent. And the Yugoslavs are very, very yeah. independent the people. The Yugoslavs, all of them. The right Yugoslavs now. are very independent people. Right. They 
under the pressure of the Soviet Union, they began to wind down joint enterprises mm -hmm. uh, with the Soviet Union in the late 40s. They began to, they brought about the withdrawal of Russian military advisors, which, by the way, had mm -hmm. been with the partisans as well as uh, British officers and some Americans, I think. Um, and uh, then uh, an interesting event in 1949, uh, Mr. John Foster Dulles uh, secretly flew to the island of Brioni in the Adriatic and met with Marshal Tito uh -huh. and offered him not just a window but a very large foot in the door mm. in the sense that uh, Tito, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Foster Dulles offered Tito a, uh, a kind of tacit alliance with the United States to stand against possible Soviet expansionism in the Balkans. Mm. And as a matter of fact, the, um, there was a tacit and a secret alliance between Yugoslavia after, say, the early 50s, from the early 50s, and the United States in particular in the framework of NATO. Mm -hmm. There were very large bases which were to be activated in the event of a conflagration between the major powers uh, in Yugoslavia. Secret bases like the, the enormous Brovnik split or what? Oh no, much no. more serious stuff than that. Uh, uh, a major underground military ba uh, air base in Croatia huh. uh, at Bursko. Yeah. Uh, there were other bases. This is the seventies. Of that no, 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 this I'm is sorry. from the fifties. All right, all right. I'm so sorry. So that of course, Yugoslavia, yeah, right. Yugoslavia undertook actually military obligations uh, within the context of the NATO mm -hmm. uh, confrontation with the Soviet Union. For instance, the Yugoslav forces undertook the obligation to block the movement of Soviet forces into southern Italy from mm -hmm. Hungary. Mm -hmm. uh, there were very specific engagements uh, which were undertaken. Now, in return, the Yugoslavs uh, received enormous military assistance from the United States. Well, from NATO, but really 90% of that military assistance mm -hmm. uh, was from the U.S. Yugoslav officers were trained in the United States. The Yugoslav received enormous technical assistance in its aircraft industry, in its military industry. The, the, it enabled the creation, that assistance enabled the creation of a very powerful, very modern military force in Yugoslavia. And of course, that was a, a NATO asset. Yeah, and, the, and those forces were under the... Uh, command of the Yugoslavs. Under command of the Yugoslavs right. and of Mr. Tito. Right. And of uh, Belgrade. Of Belgrade, but in the event of a confrontation between East and West, they, would par they were to participate in, uh, in activities, in military actions against the, aimed at the Soviet Union. Now, what was the role of the Soviet Union in terms of the support, let's say militarily, or the logistics, or the internal logistics to the East, as it were, then, in a certain sense, in terms of uh, military support? And how do we begin to understand whence came the weapons that are being utilized in the Balkans Today? now? Uh, it seems from our perception to be overwhelmingly in the hands of the Serbian forces that they seem to be no, uh, very, very well armed. But what was, the, what was the realities of that? And what has been historically the tie to the Soviet Union in terms of arms and the arms that do appear and are there in, uh, in, in the Balkans? In well, the, what was or what is Yugoslavia? Let me start by saying that Yugoslavia saw between 45 and 81, 82, a quite a remarkable transformation, really. It yeah. became an industrial state, All right. an industrialized country. Not fully industrialized, still with a large portion, uh, minority of its population uh, working the land, but nonetheless, a, a, a semi-modern industrialized state. Was that geographically, uh, geographically identifiable? For both it is the north, it is up in Belgrade. No, not only there is the Serbia. there is the there is a widespread view that the exclusive area of industrialization was Croatia and Slovenia, but it's not true. Mm -hmm. Let me just give you an example. One of the most modern industries in Yugoslavia is uh, uh, the arms industry. Very large, by the way. Mm -hmm. I think it probably was in the beginning of the 80s or the mid 80s perhaps the fifth largest arms industry in the world. Industry, interesting. Exporter, sorry, I should correct myself. A mm -hmm. very, very significant exporter Ex of arms. Exporter of? Exporter of, of military equipment and, and arms. And manufacturer of? Oh, and manufacturer, absolutely. Manufacturer they of small arms, not, not, not. No, not no, 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 no. Really, the, the Yugoslavs manufacture everything from tanks to sophisticated uh, 
electronics for uh, and avionics. For let, me, let me ask you a naive question pilots. that I yeah. should have had right at the tip of my tongue. I don't, right. I, I don't have a, what's that, what, what population are we talking about? Do you happen to, in oh, Yugoslavia, Yugoslavia, 25 million. About 25 million. Right. And they had built up an industry, one of which was an arms. A arms. Very, now, it's important to remember that after the building conflict uh, uh, tensions, if you like, with the Soviet Union, the Yugoslavs removed their arms industry and concentrated it where? In Bosnia. 70% mm -hmm. of this very modern arms industry is in Bosnia today and was in Bosnia when uh, Mr. Izet Begovic uh, declared the independence of his republic in April 1992, April of last year, right? Oh, okay. uh, well, now, yeah. most of the areas which are <coughs> occupied by the Muslims are areas which have large portions of that 70% of the Yugoslav arms industry. What, what percentage would you say, uh, you've brought this point up, it's new to me, the, 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 what percentage of the arms that are, are there in terms of the fighting on the ground or in the air, uh, in, there, in, in what was Yugo, in Yugoslavia, is, uh, had been domestically produced and what percentage? Oh, would uh, you, just off the top of your the head, vast, make, the vast majority been from outside? And from where outside, and what are the realities? The vast majority, vast majority domestically produced? produced domestically. Some of the stuff under license, for instance, uh, the Yugoslavs produced uh, Soviet T-52s, etc. And the, but they produced their own versions of the 72 called M84. They produced uh, they produced that themselves. Fifth but largest in the world, you said they were. I, I'm, my recollection is that it was the fifth largest arms exporter at a certain stage, maybe the mid '80s. I could be wrong, maybe six. Uh -huh. But right, it's significant. A, it's yeah, a significant absolutely. producer yeah. of modern arms and equipment. Now, uh, apart from that, then if we were to look at that, and you said we had armed the, the uh, you know the, the the partisans in the Second War, and there had been this help. ideological tie help, and there had been this ideological tie to the Soviet Union, communism, there was this quasi ties to NATO, there were right. ties back to Moscow mm -hmm. and so forth. And um, I'm just in a certain sense curious uh, as to the, uh, you say domestic, and not to avoid it, but those that were not domestically produced and what has been the reality of supply lines and geopolitical supply, supply lines of mm. externally generated mm -hmm. materials that would support a war. In the present the, conflict. With Leading up to and within the present conflict. There are two principles, external sources of arms in the Yugoslav conflicts today. There are two conflicts, essentially. Right. Uh, one between Croatia and uh, the Serbian populations of Croatia and Bosnia. And one between, on the one hand, uh, Bosnian Muslims and Bosnian Croats and a part of the Croat army on, in place in Bosnia and the army of the Republic of, uh, uh, the Serbian Republic of, of Bosnia, which includes uh, 35,000 regulars, perhaps 40, and uh, 35,000 irregular troops. Mm -hmm. And they're roughly matched in size. The Croatian army has between 45,000 and 50,000 men and weapons inside Bosnia today. That's something that's not much talked about. These are regulars, like oh, those are regular members. Yeah. Those are those are bri those are brigades of the regular Croatian. And they army. they would have overall been part of an overall Yugoslav force that would have been there previously. Right. And they've divided. Oh no, along. no, they weren't there previously. No, these these troops are troops because there had been a military Yugoslavic military right. well, presence and established order and that withdrew so from Bosnia in the spring of 1992. That withdrew to and where to Yugoslavia to Yugoslavia. Right. right. Now some of that, some of the people who might have been stationed in Bosnia in the Yugoslav army before that, might have withdrawn to Croatia. Many uh, many Croatian officers. Uh, for instance, left the Yugoslav army with the outbreak of the war between uh, the wars in Croatia in the spring of 1991, the year mm -hmm. previously. They were then integrated into, became part of um, the, the Croatian uh, uh, army. Now, it's that army which uh, actually invaded uh, Bosnia last year. I see. You, but you, you had said earlier there were two sources of arms. Two sources, two primary external sources of arms today. One is Germany. Germany, for instance, is perhaps this week completing the delivery of two squadrons of MiG-21s to Croatia. Mm -hmm. uh, it has provided military advisors and weapons of many kinds, more light weapons, I think, 
There are rumors about German Leopard tanks being used in Bosnia. They haven't been confirmed so far as I know. Um, but there's no doubt that the Germans had a very large hand in equipping and preparing the Croatian army uh, uh, in the end of 90, the beginning of 91. And those, those links would have gone back through time? Uh, well, Mr. Mr. the Cole political was very, very quick to recognize the political the relationships. Well, I would say that Mr. Cole's recognition of the seceding republics is pr is n without any doubt what precipitated the wars in Yugoslavia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It didn't start them, but it turned them into major into major international conflicts. All right, we, we, we can go on we to that. Come back. That's the, the, other matters, source, the other source, right, the other source of arms uh, going into uh, uh, going into uh, Bosnia today is a pipeline uh, from uh, the major Islamic countries, uh, Pakistan, Iran, and Saudi Arabia, who are obviously competing uh, uh, against each other for influence in the Bosnian, Bosnian Muslim is that Is that reaching significant dimension as far as you know? Yeah, it's not insignificant. The number of volunteers I don't think is really very large, maybe. Four or five hundred in Bosnia now, but uh, it's not insignificant. And the arms are becoming insignificant, and the military advisors also, by the way, I forgot to mention that the Turks are very, very important in yeah, this, yeah. Uh, in this uh, great power game that's going on. Yeah, and, there, and there's, great, uh, there's great feeling among uh, a good deal of the Muslim world as they see, as we have seen, uh, a great deal of the... Uh, well, we, this term is, uh, is what come seems up, the to be the persecution cleansing. of the Muslims. What seems to mm -hmm. be the persecution of the Muslims by an overwhelmingly powerful Serbian force has been able to exert itself. Well, and uh, well, you're aware of the Western presses, and I perhaps am. you see things differently than that. Uh, well, it's very difficult to to be on the spot and to terrible at the terrible same time be willing to uh, rape camps and so forth. You have to look at all of this stuff very carefully. Mm -hmm. uh, let me remind you about the incubator incident. In Let, Kuwait. Right. Yeah. Let me remind you about the fact that <coughs> there's a vast official propaganda mechanism at work in every major Western country, uh, which emanates from the government, which organizes uh, mass propaganda campaigns. Look, uh, there's, a, there's a part of the directorate uh, of operations of the Central Intelligence Agency that deals with these things and hundreds of people are employed there. Similarly, in the United States Information Agency, similarly in parts of the British Foreign and Commonwealth Office. So let's start from the fact that official propaganda is a fact and that there are massive mechanisms for organizing that. The question at issue here is, when we look at what we have seen in the media in the West during the last year and a half, as far as Yugoslavia or whatever you wish to call the various parts of it, uh, is concerned, are we dealing with honest, objective reporting, or are we dealing with, to a very large extent, with officially inspired and indeed fabricated propaganda? All right, officially inspired and, prop and uh, fabricated propaganda on the part of whom? Ah, primarily on the part of Germany, I would say. The Germans have a very great interest in this situation. Let me just sketch that very briefly, okay? Uh, at the end of the 1980s, as you know, uh, the communist regimes in Eastern Europe were really disintegrating. Yes, under it, various it's the whole world pressure, changed. In under 1989. various kinds of pressures. And, okay? uh, and, the, and the, the centrifugal forces that are exerting themselves in Yugoslavia, there is a, a relationship between that fact and, well, the, and the fact that there is this difficulty uh, emerging in Yugoslavia. Well, yes and no. And uh, let's, but let's, let's just start with the fact that this was a fact in the end of the 80s, all right? Now, in 1989, uh, Germany was reunified. That made Germany far and away the most powerful country on continental Europe. Oh, there's no doubt. Yeah, okay. that's the engine of Europe. Yeah, it will be. Now, we also country. have to remember that. Uh, Germany at the time, and this was particularly accentuated by the process of unification, had already experienced, as the United States and France and uh, Britain and Italy and other Western countries have, uh, long years of economic dislocation, mm -hmm. slowing of economic growth, rising of unemployment. Germany today has more than 10.5% unemployment. Well, yeah, they, 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 they're, they're absorbing 
East Germany. Well, they had high unemployment Germany. before they absorbed Eastern, uh, Eastern Germany. The Eastern Germany has created an absolute economic cataclysm for Western Europe because of the manner in which it sought to absorb. You don't so think they'll get their act together, a unified absolutely Germany? Absolutely out of the question. Really? My, well, really? it depends on what you mean. Economically, there's no way in which they can make it viable. But, but that's a... That's, that's an economic question we can look at if yeah, you want. Could, that's a whole other couple that's, hours of that's discussion. A, that's yeah, another that's hour's great, discussion. But that is a big important thing. But go ahead. That I'm is an important thing. So we have the, the disintegration of the Eastern European regimes. By the way, the death of Tito is 1980, which is a not insignificant date and, a, yeah, and right. an important of course, uh, yeah. factor contributing to this situation. We have long years of economic stagnation and dislocation in the West. By the way, that was transmitted to Yugoslavia through reductions in trade, reductions in investment, uh, reductions in immigrant remittances, etc., so that Yugoslavia through the 1970s was affected by the economic crisis in the West, which deepened and deepened, uh, you know, from 1972, 1973. When Germany absorbed Eastern Germany, West Germany absorbed Eastern Germany, that economic difficulty was really greatly enhanced. We then saw, actually it had begun well before that, a rise of a new kind of nationalism in Germany, which hasn't been seen there in a long time. And if you look at the German debates, which have been going on for some time now, they are fairly hair-raising. German academics, historians, etc., are really debating anew how bad Hitler was. Mm -hmm. It's that's the tenor of the debate. There's a massive, there's a very large revisionist debate going on in Germany, which has accompanied by, been accompanied by, and I think facilitated the rise of nationalism. And we have also the rise of the right-wing extremist groups. By the way, I have to remind you Skinheads that... Skinheads and whatnot, and well, these kind of... Well, like uh, Deutsche Alternative, these groups which, uh, which are uh, essentially street combat groups, yeah. but they're well, financed through the electoral system because they when you create a political party in Germany, you get subsidies from the electoral system in order to field your candidates. Uh, you think you think you think these street ruffians and people doing firebombings of immigrants and shouting Auslander, Roust, and so forth are supported by the government, officially by the government, or officially are they by just, the government? Uh, That's a complicated dis, dis, question. Disaffected individuals it, who are lashing out. No, at no, it's much more systematic than that. The they're supported. They're that. supported by by important figures in industry, and they are supported by people in the government in very discreet ways, obviously. But just to give you an example, there are, two, there are two deputy directors of the Federal Ministry of Defense in Germany, a Federal Ministry of the Interior in Germany, an enormously important department in Germany, who are actually members of revanchist Eastern parties, mm. uh, the, particularly Sudeten, Sudeten Deutsche parties, which uh, uh, in any case, yeah, yeah, we shouldn't get these too connections field. exist. Mm. But most important of all of these things, Germany began consciously rebuilding its cultural and economic links into and efforts to it penetrate Central and Eastern Europe mm. systematically. And Southeastern Europe, Yugoslavia, has always been one of the areas which have been in historically in German imperial sites. And with the reunification of Germany and the rise of nationalism and all that that's been accompanied by, we have seen a definite, clear, clearly defined, traceable uh, German effort to resume its dominance in Central Europe, particularly East Central Europe, that is, say, Hungary, Poland, and Czechoslovakia. And the Czechs, for instance, maintain that... Uh, well, Czechoslovakia, right, just the German, it up again now. Well, yes, but yeah. the Czechs maintain that the Germans played a critical role in precipitating the schism in Czech of Czechoslovakia, mm -hmm. the separation of Slovakia. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And uh, there's very good reason for believing that. I mean, the Germans, don't forget, had historic ties to the Slovaks. They did, in Slovakia, during the Second World War, very much what they did in the independent Croatian state. It wasn't quite as horrible, but... the there were Slovak fascists. The Germans uh, supported them. There was a Nazi puppet state in Slovakia, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. What I'm saying is yeah. that a lot of the, of the ugliness that we saw in the 1930s and the 1920s in uh, Western Europe and in Germany in particular really is, uh, is resuming. That's now. very, very worrying. I mean, that's uh, another 
you know, that, that's very worrying to you. But it is an important element here in understanding what's happened in Yugoslavia because yep. the Germans yeah. really helped to precipitate that. They helped to precipitate the war between Croatia and Yugoslavia, the secession of Croatia, and they have armed, assisted, advised, etc., guided uh, the independent, the, the new version of the independent Croatian state under Mr. Tuzman. And do you think, do you, do you, do you think that the, the, uh, the, re, the, the, the hand of Germany and in, uh, the, the, uh, that, the, uh, that the, the Serbian, boy, I wonder if you could put this in a perspective for us, this last year or so, that the Serbian um, um, uh, uh, activity was, was, was a reaction to that or what? what, what Okay, Serbian activity. Because we've Let's had, go. We've, we've had we've people like George Schultz and uh, ex-President Reagan and mm. uh, all sorts of people of the very highest authority in this country condemn what yes, we sir. see on right. television. Uh, people talking now about uh, the Bosnians who have suffered. Uh, t today, as you and I talk on February 24, they're airlifting uh, and airdropping supplies right. into Bosnia the suffering Bosnian people, and in the minds of the American people, the Serbian forces have been ruthless and, uh, and uh, a, right. an aggressive force that ought to be confronted, even on to talking about the using of, use of air power against uh, right. Belgrade. Uh, There's no doubt so that forth. we are. And what is the reality as far as you see all of these, which you obviously can see, is the perception that is felt by many of the leadership and much of the general society in this country. And we feel uh, frustrated that we're not able to go in because our military advisors tell us we get ourselves into another sort of uh, Vietnam quagmire and we mustn't enter militarily. And do you think we might? And some of these questions that are so much in the, in the, in the, in the well, thinking of the American people I think it's now. important. Put some of that in perspective. I think it's important us. to come to the situation today to the, uh, the Vance Owen plan, Mark yeah, II, uh, the, the version generated by the Clinton administration, the new proposals to go into, into Bosnia, the position of the United States military. But the background, let's just say something about that. Um, there is a conflict in Bosnia, a major conflict in Bosnia, border, just as there is in Croatia uh, uh, between Serbs and, uh, and Croatians. Both of those conflicts were precipitated by a very simple fact, the secession of these states from Yugoslavia, without attention to regulating the status of Serbs in Croatia and in Bosnia. This is a very serious question because of the historical background which I mentioned, the independent Croatian state and the genocide conducted against various populations, the Serbs in particular, between 1941 and 1945. W at the time that Croatia declared its independence in June of 1991, there were uh, 700, 750,000 Serbs living in parts uh, in the Krajinas, as they're called, which, by the way, is the geopolitical heart of Croatia. Uh, there were 1,300,000, 1, 1,400,000 Serbs uh, living in Bosnia at the time that mm, Bosnian independence was declared in April of last year. These secessions uh, took place in a manner which raised the historic fears, historically justified fears, of the Serbian populations of these areas that they would be the target of genocidal persecutions again. Why? When Mr. Tuzman uh, became the president of Croatia, declared its independence, passed legislation which uh, purged Serbs from government service, uh, changed property rights of Serbs living in Croatia, uh, mandated the purge of Serbs from uh, the universities, the media, etc., in the name of democratization, but nonetheless and began this, in addition, uh, right-wing extremists in Croatia uh, carried out military attacks on Serbian communities, and the Serbs resisted. That's how the war in Croatia began. That's why the Yugoslav army intervened in Croatia. Now, again, remember that uh, the Muslims in Bosnia sought to create, stated so, still do, and it's a very important issue which is denied in this country, 
uh, a fundamentalist Islamic state in the middle of Europe. Uh, and uh, that also ignored the historic rights of Serbs to be considered an equivalent nationality as they had been before Croatian succession in Croatia, uh, with equal rights to other members of the population, and as they saw it, exposed them once again to the threat of genocidal persecution. Where would this, where would this, uh, st where would this entity be? This Muslim-oriented entity in Bosnia, geographic in, in Bos Bosnia, in the whole of Bosnia. The secession of yes, the secession of Bosnia took place uh, uh, when the Muslim population of Bosnia was 44 percent of the total. 44 percent of the total, a minority. Uh -huh. Uh, by the way, that's against the constitution of the Bosnian Republic itself. The Bosnian Republic you mean to set up a, 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 a uh, secession without the consensus of the three principal nationality groups is against the Bosnian Republic's own constitution in 1992. Okay, mm -hmm. so all of these things that were done were totally illegal. The illegalities in themselves frighten the Serbs. Mm -hmm. The determination of the Croatians to discriminate against and to leave the Serb, the Serb populations out of equivalent consideration constitutionally, as happened in Bosnia, that really began to, to raise all these old fears. And the Serbs reacted. The Serbs reacted by saying, okay, we will ourselves uh, choose to secede as a Serbian nationality in Bosnia, in Croatia, from these independent republics and become uh, members of Yugoslavia and ex accede to membership of Yugoslavia. That's really what they would like to see. They, but they would like, this whole thing, by the way, could be settled very simply. How? By according to the Serbian populations of these republics, the same rights and privileges, the same property rights, etc., as belong according to their constitutions, to all other citizens. What has happened with the Croatian and the Bosnian secessions is that monoethnicity has been declared as the only right and proper basis for self-determination. Mm -hmm. But this is complete balderdash. Mm -hmm. It's historical nonsense. It's legal nonsense. And frankly, it's only because it serves the strategic interests of outside powers, powers not part of that region, that this has been tolerated. And that around this, a whole series of myths have been created, which create the impression which you were describing a few minutes ago. It makes, well, yeah, and it, it, which is a very widespread one here. It makes one think a little bit of Cyprus, where the uh, Turks and the, and, and the Greeks had fought so for Cyprus, then they divided the island into two groups. Right. And it doesn't make any sense economically because at all. They, it course. doesn't make sense economically, but it did make sense in the sense that they were killing each other and fighting over these ancient animosities. And there are some attempts now then to try and divide the people in the area of Yugoslavia into groups. So because in, in the sense, or the one would think there's a sense, that these groups simply cannot get along together. Well, let me raise a further irony it's, in unless this there, Unless there is this overpowering force of uh, unity, uh, Tito, or something well, that hold them together. And uh, I think that's a know. false perception, I have yeah. to tell you, because I think there has been a very great effort to work at the stimulation of nationalist tendencies in order to fragment Yugoslavia. Na nationalist tendencies, in this case, being Yugoslav? No, uh, no, no. Croatian, Slovenian secessionism, Bosnian secessionism, Muslim fundamentalism. Well, yeah, all of these, including Albanian secessionism, yeah. all of these nationalities have been appealed to, to some extent, financed, cosseted, assisted, directed by outside powers in order to bring about the dismemberment of Yugoslavia. Well, we have it not only in Yugoslavia, we have it in all kinds of places in the world. You mentioned before right. Czechoslovakia. We have right. it in Tajikistan, right. we have it in Kyrgyzstan, we have Georgia. all sorts of uh, entities and ethnic entities mm -hmm. on the subcontinent of uh, right. uh, India, we have it in Africa, we have it all over the place, these ethnic groups which are asserting themselves as nations which had previously been part of an, uh, a nation, an ethnic group was part of a nation, 
there was unity, but there seems to be ethnicity. Right. I'm not sure exactly what we mean by that. This is a whole other program is becoming the basis of political sovereignty in the minds of many. Well, you and see there's the this problem tremendous is, centrifugal yes. force which mm. is exerting itself on a worldwide scale and one wonders how many nation, we used to say nation state, we don't even say ethnic state, but the ethnicity seems to want to become the basis of political sovereignty in the see, modern world. This is impossible. And it becomes economically unworkable, but I just wonder if... Apart uh, from the economics, however, I mean, apart, apart from, the, from the economics... It's not just in Yugoslavia. This is no, I understand that, but let's look at the example of Yugoslavia. Apart from the economics, obviously the secessions have shattered Yugoslav in infrastructure totally, uh, destroyed the linkages between industries across markets, etc. It's, it's an economic catastrophe for the secessionist yeah, states, right? Right, 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 right. But then there is a further paradox, a very, a very bitter irony, actually which is that while for, I would say, for simple geostrategic convenience, various powers, including the United States and Germany in particular, by the way, resisted very long time by the Netherlands and France and Great Britain behind the scenes. They fought bitterly to prevent Germany from doing what it did inside the European community. Uh, while these powers decry the impossibility of holding a nation of many ethnicities like Yugoslavia together, what they are doing is creating mini-republics with the same ethnic contradictions and puzzles. The, the, the Bosnia is not a state with 80% or 85% or 90% Muslim population. There's only 44%. It's going to compound the problem. Right. So there, the problem here is, and the same is true of Croatia, it has an enormous Serbian population. Okay. There is no way in the world that you can draw a map of Yugoslavia which will contain a, sign a really large majority of any individual ethnic group. It's just not possible. Okay, we only so have intermixed. Yeah, we only people. have about two minutes right. left. I wonder, uh, Vance own plan, or Vance, or Vance own plan, and really quickly, what in just sum it up now. Right. What what what's what's going to happen there? Well, it's we clear that uh, it's clear that there's a, a, a strong uh, desire on the part of some U.S. politicians to involve the United States in this war, or at the very least, to prolong it. Prolonging this war serves a very important strategic American purpose, which is it's totally disrupting the European continent at a critical moment when it's trying to move towards political integration. That's a very important consequence. Germany, Italy, and other European countries have suffered tremendously from sanctions. Mm -hmm. right? uh, but there's a very great danger here that the so-called minor military assistance to these so-called humanitarian efforts can explode into a major conflict. And the Yugoslavs are now telling the United States behind the scenes that they really are risking a major conflagration which could place them in the same situation that the Germans found themselves in when they tried to occupy the country. Yeah, in the that's why World there's War. so much. Sorry, we could go on talking for hours. Thank you. Sure you Thank are. you very much. <laughs> okay. It's been your pleasure. Sorry, we're running short on time. Lots of fun. Uh, uh, Sean Gervasi, then, who has uh, filled us in uh, very, very admirably, uh, only just sort of whetted our appetite for so much to learn. <laughs> Makes us want to go and get the books and so <laughs> forth. And your pleasure to have had his perceptions. Thanks again very much, Sean, for Thanks coming so in. Much. Thanks, uh, We on Conversations invite you to tune in again next week. We'll be coming back next week, same time. Uh, that's it for this particular program. Again, thank you very much. And good night. We'll see you next week. Okay. Good night.